On this episode of Faith and Focus, I want to take a pause. I've been going through the book of James, but I want to take a pause from that and I want to respond. I saw this article from Not the Bee, which is the Babylon Bee's true news uh, page. I guess Babylon Bee obviously is the satire <coughs> page. They have fake news and satirical news. But not to be, I think, was started kind of as a way of saying, look at this ridiculous news story that sounds like something that would be on the Babylon Bee, but it's actually really happening. So they're kind of a more actual true news uh, site, but they are still have a funny kind of offbeat note to them. So if you don't follow not to be, you should follow them. But on there, they had shared and they kind of cut into this Twitter thread. But it's a Twitter thread from Smash Bales. So obviously, as their handle suggests, that's what they like to do is smash idols that crop up within Christianity. So kind of a fun follow as well, Smash Bales, if you're on Twitter. But they had this long Twitter thread about why young men don't want to go to church. And I appreciate this thread. And I want to I want to comment the parts that I agree with it on. Now I think the opposite extreme is kind of your John Eldridge Wild at Heart type books. And I remember I tried to read Wild at Heart, and um, I could not get into it at all. <laughs> um, maybe I'm uh, not man enough. I don't know, but. I couldn't get into it. It just seemed like he was saying, like, God created man outdoors in a garden, so men need to be outdoors and climb mountains and be in the woods or something. I just could not resonate with it. I'm like, I don't want to climb mountains. I don't want to go hunting. I don't want to do these manly type things, I guess. So I couldn't resonate with it. I let it, I set it down after a couple, couple chapters. But so I do, I do think that that the, the opposite extreme of like, you know, men need in the church need to be like man, men, you know, with chopping down trees and stuff and like liver King type Christianity. Obviously that's not the case, but something has been lost. Christianity does not seem to appeal to men. And I want to go through this, but I, I think by and large, the part of what it means to be a man, like that adventure, probably what wild at heart maybe is trying to get to, but it's that idea of this adventure, this adventurous spirit wanting to um, go beyond the horizon and explore and be on the cutting edge seems to be a predominantly man uh, venture. Uh, you know, I've heard Andrew Clavin, he gets into a lot of trouble when he says stuff like this, but he always says like whenever a, a domain becomes dominated by women, that's a, a domain or an industry that it's on the decline. And he says it's not that it's not because women are entering it that it's causing it to decline. That's indicative of the fact that it's on the decline. So, uh, and and again, he gets a lot of grief for this, but he says, you know, it's because men are always out there on the cutting edge. They're the ones who are launching themselves on rockets into space. They're the ones saying, Hey, let's go crash this rocket into the moon and walk around on the moon for a little bit and then come back to earth. Men are the ones doing that because they're, crazy and they're adventurous and they want to be on this cutting edge of river. So the, once it becomes uh, dominated by women, it's because men have already kind of explored that territory and they're like, all right, let's move on to something new. We've, we're kind of done with this thing. And maybe that's offensive to women, but that just seems to be uh, the reality. Uh, businesses predominantly started by men and uh, you know, new ventures, movies, directing movies, creating movies, then creating video games, creating television, like all of these new ventures just seem to be dominated by men until they're not anymore. It's because men have moved on to something new. Again, don't take it up with me. I'm just reiterating what other people have said and what reality seems to, to bear out. So that then raises the question, why, why is the church, why don't men seem to want to go to church? They don't seem to want to be involved. They don't seem to want to lead within churches. Uh, anecdotally and just statistically, you see that, that that men are reluctantly drugged to churches by their family. Their wives are being, you know, dragging them to church. It's not like they're taking them to church, which that seems to be a problem. 
So this thread says young men don't want to go to church. Why? Church has become feminized in its language, teaching, and worship. If men don't like this, they're told they are bad Christians. Yet it doesn't have to be like this. The language of church has been feminized. Christianity isn't a religion, but a relationship. While it's true that we're in a relationship with our Creator, the relationship described by evangelicals is more of a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship instead of the father-child relationship. However, this boyfriend relationship is quite accurate to how the modern church treats the Christian life. The quality of one's Christian walk is determined much like how a teenage girl determines the quality of her relationship. Emotions. And so I think this is definitely true. I think that we have narrowed our relationship with God down to how how we feel about our relationship with God. If we feel like God is not close with us, we conclude we don't have a close relationship with God. If I don't feel energized to go to church, if I don't feel excited, if I don't feel worshipful, if I don't feel, you know, whatever, I hear something from the word of God that doesn't make me feel good. It's always about how we feel. And that seems to dominate the Christian landscape. Rather than realizing that, okay, that might be a facet of our relationship with God. God's obviously an infinite being. And it would be just as equally wrong to think of our relationship with God as only a father and a child. But that is a, a, a very prominent aspect of our relationship with God. So we have to understand our relationship with God in terms of our father-child. But it would also be wrong to only view it that way. You know, The church, of course, they will talk about this later, the church is viewed as the bride of Christ. That's different necessarily than the individual being viewed as the bride of Christ. But the church is the bride of Christ. So there is a husband-wife relationship with God and his people corporately. So we, we could talk about different facets of that. But then there's this idea of creator and creation. That's a relationship that we have with God. He is the creator. We are the creation. So we could talk about you know God being the sculptor or the, the, the potter, and we're the clay. That's a relationship and has certain ramifications. Uh, Lord and master and servant, that's a relationship. That's a different relationship than a father-son relationship. So there's all of these different things, but when we do narrow it down to just a relationship like a boyfriend-girlfriend, that doesn't seem to be very appealing to have a relationship with the God of the universe, and it's not very sustainable either, right? I think that we... We have we have an aspect of our relationship that is incorporates our feelings. But our feelings shouldn't be our predominant driver, especially when we th- think of our relationship with God as a parent and a child. There are times when parents and children have a relationship that is, you know, emotional, and obviously that's a huge part of it, but... But there are times when you're a parent, and my mom used to always say that she's not concerned about our day-to-day happiness. She's concerned about our overall happiness. And what she meant was she wants us to be, she wants her children to be happy in life. Not at the expense of being happy in the moment. So she would much rather us be upset because we were punished or disciplined if that's going to make us into a happy or a a fulfilled person in our life. But if we as our, as a parent child relationship, if we operate based on, Oh, I just want to make sure you feel good. Well, then we're obviously going to compromise on discipline and responsibility and, and things that make the child not happy. But what do children know? Children don't know what they need or what they what they want. So th- they want short-term pleasure. But parents should know better than to just give that to them. So parents will do things that make their kids not feel good sometimes because it's good for them in the long run. But if we view our relationship with God just based on our feelings, then obviously if we feel bad, we're going to, that's, that's going to raise some tension. We're going to feel like God doesn't love us or doesn't want what's best for us. 
And conversely, we're going to do things that make us feel good and then justify those things as the will of God because, well, certainly God wants me to feel good and to be happy when that's not the case. If he is also our Lord and our Father, he may be saying things like, this is your responsibility, this is your duty, this is what I have told you to do, I'm not asking, I'm telling you, you know, and, you know, your feelings be damned. We don't, God's not overly concerned about our feelings if something needs to be done. And that is a call to responsibility and a call to a challenge and a call to adventure that does probably appeal to men more than it does to women. You know, men, men want that responsibility. They're, they're wired to have that responsibility and part of that leadership. So the thing, things like the great commission where, where God is sending us on mission and in in the battlefield language that's used in the Bible, the armor of God, you know, standing firm in Christ, you know, having this sure footing as we're in battle, the 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 devil's roaring, uh, uh, traveling around like a roaring lion, looking to devour somebody. He's the enemy of our souls. We're st- tearing down strongholds. All of this language that's used in the Bible of military language. That's because we are on mission. We are in a spiritual war for the hearts and minds and souls of people around the world who don't know Christ. And when you think about it in those terms, that is a call that could be appealing to men if churches emphasized the high call of the mission and the challenge of the war that we're in. But when all of that gets stripped away, which obviously it has. Now, we can argue about whether the chicken or the egg thing. Did the feminizing of Christianity strip away the mission? Or did the de-emphasizing of the mission just basically make men realize, well, there's nothing here for me. Why would I waste my time, you know, coming to church and making to be be felt like a woman with no purpose to, and like a, in a, in a mission, in a war. So, we can debate what came first, but the result is now, well, there's no discipleship. Discipleship's not happening either because why would you need to train and disciple and challenge people to what? Show up to church and sing some songs and cry? That doesn't take discipleship. A baby does those kinds of things. A small child does those kinds of things that does not understand you know, the, the, the gravity of the situation of what, of what life presents to them. So that doesn't require any discipleship. So therefore discipleship isn't needed. And then therefore men are left thinking, I'm not training for anything. I mean, Cause again, think about men, like men want challenging careers. They, they will push themselves to have to train and and fight for top leadership positions and careers. And that's probably a male instinct or, or an aggressive instinct that's usually found in men. Men will do that in, in their career, but we as Christians should say, channel that energy towards the things of the Lord. Who cares about your career? Who cares about your stupid aspirations in sports or the athletics or whatever? that's a waste of your time in light of eternity. What matters is this, this fight that we're in for the souls of people for the great commission. And so that, that there can be that, that challenge and that call to serious Christian living that would require discipleship, which would require serious learning of scripture and serious studying of theology and serious time commitment to the body of Christ and the people of God and to learning God's word and that would appeal to men, but there's no purpose to do any of that stuff. Why would we? What's the reason? Because the mission has been lost. If you've been a listener of Faith and Focus for a while, I would encourage you to become a supporter of the ministry by becoming a monthly donor. Your generous donations allow me to continue working within faith and recording new content. You can find a link to my donation page in the show notes for this episode. Thank you. There's a couple thoughts on just this idea of, you know, if we just have our emotions be at the center of it, 
Well, that's pretty weak and doesn't require a whole lot. But this uh, thread goes on. Uh, men's Bible studies are emotional introspection sessions, but with bacon. The first question is along the lines of, how did you feel towards Jesus this week? If you don't feel like the Pinterest girl with her coffee and Bible looks, then something is wrong with you. The same can be said of modern worship music, as it sounds more like the songs belong on a Taylor Swift album than in the book of Psalms. Pastors have said if singing this song makes you feel uncomfortable as a man, then you need to get over it. The question to determine good worship has become, how did it make you feel instead of, how did this honor God? Even in the most complementarian churches, men are told that they are basically the same as women, apart from the physical traits. The only difference is men are pastors. Then in the same breath, men are told to lead their family, but are given no tools to do so. The only thing offered to them is a quote servant, being a quote servant leader. So, yeah, I think that a lot of the worship music that's sung in churches is weak. I think a lot of the times I spend half my time listening to the lyrics thinking, this is not even biblical. It's not even in accordance with truth. And I always feel hamstrung to because I feel like a lot of the times I'm surrounded by people people you know if i go to bible studies something like that and we're singing and, and the atmosphere is this this one of like feel goodery i feel like i don't want to be the anti-spiritual person who's like hey this song sucks it's not biblical here's where it's wrong here's where it's wrong here's where it's wrong you know pointing out the the, the falsehoods in these songs and everyone gets offended because well the song made us feel good well, the question, that, that's not the question of how, that that's actually part of the downside of music, is it does play on our emotions and our feelings, and then the content of it is what's important. I mean, Satan can, make, can write a good worship song and slide in falsehood, but it makes us feel good. That shouldn't be the judge any more than if you've got a pastor or a Bible teacher standing in front of you teaching a bunch of stuff, if it makes you feel good, who cares if he's, you know, what if a, I, I could almost guarantee a pastor, it would almost be a good thought experiment to see done. I can almost guarantee a pastor who's very charismatic and very funny and very witty and very charming and very engaging could stand up in front of a church and preach from the Quran or the Book of Mormon and do it in such a way that makes the audience feel good and laugh. He's got a lot of charisma when he does it and the people would have no concept that they're being taught from a false book a false religion because it made them feel good the reality is the content is not the gospel though so i i think that we've we've twisted that and i think that men are kind of left there thinking okay we've got this music that is supposed to play on my emotions but the, the, it's it's empty of of the gospel. It's empty of the the message that really should be driving our Christian life. And I really like what they say. And you know, men are told to lead their family, but given no tools to do so. Uh, I think that this is incredibly uh, insightful because we, as as Christians, are facing a a serious crisis of families falling apart marriages falling apart children not being discipled and raised to follow god and to be on mission and to be uh, focused on the great commission and missions and ministry discipleship biblical literacy kids aren't raised to think about those things and part of this comes down to men are expected to lead their homes and lead their families and to love their wives like Christ loves the church. The, the Bible's clear on that. That is their calling. Yet they're not being given the tools to do so. If a man doesn't know how to be like Christ, how could he love his wife like Christ loves the church? How could he raise his children to love Christ if he himself has not been discipled to love Christ. 
if all he has been taught is to feel good, do what feels good, do what makes you happy, well, then he hasn't been given the tools to really challenge his family to live for God. So then he's kind of crippled and just passively, I guess I'll just sit here and be an ATM machine. I'll go to work and make money, provide money. So then my, my wife can raise the children to whatever, do whatever they need to do to get through school. And oftentimes this, because that impulse, right, especially in young boys, doesn't go away to want to excel and be excellent in some pursuit that, you know, they want to be the captain of their football team or, you know, the quarterback, or they want to be, you know, the, the pitcher in, in baseball or the, 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 the grand slam hitter in baseball. They want to be top of their class in academics. They want to get all these awards and prestige because that's just a male thing just to pursue excellence in these fields. And fathers should be challenging and channeling their their sons and daughters into pursuing the Lord. But if he's never been taught how to do that, the only thing he can do is just basically say, well, you know, just try to be a good person. Do whatever, you know, makes you happy and makes you feel good. You know, whether that's baseball or soccer or football or whatever it might be. Just do it, I guess, but do it under the glory of God. Well, what does that mean? Well, do it. Don't sin. Try to be nice. Say Jesus a couple times when you are playing sports. You know, I don't know. So it's really the the whole... And then if that's what life becomes, do whatever you want to do and just say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus a few times, then really, yeah, it becomes... So why do I need to go to church to do that? I can be a good person. I mean, it's good enough to make it through in the world and be viewed as a good person and then just say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus a few times. And the church doesn't really have to teach me to do that. And so the church becomes irrelevant because men are irrelevant. They, they, they're not, they don't have the tools to lead their families. And it's really kind of a sad state of affairs. And it happens over and over and over again. Continuing on in the story, they're told that, uh, they're told that this is the only Christian leadership option. Yet if leader was replaced with king, making men, quote, servant kings, this would be rejected, showing that they don't want men to lead, but instead just be servants. As Brian Suave pointed out, uh, demanding leadership without tools is no different from Pharaoh demanding bricks without straw. That's a really insightful quote. Demanding the work get done, but not providing the stuff to do it. It's no coincidence that this leadership theory arose to prominence in the late 80s, early 90s, coinciding perfectly with the creation of complementarianism. These are massive problems in the modern evangelical church that have led to men not attending church. Many respond uh, to these criticisms by saying, well, if they're really Christian men, they'll put up with it anyways. That's terrible. (laughs) That is... And that really lays the blame at the feet of the men, which, again, if, if men are supposed to be the leaders of the church, they're uh, abdicating their authority in the church is, is what's led to the rise of this. But church has become unattractive to men because it's not challenging to anybody. You know, what why why would a man waste his time going to church if it's not challenging him to do anything like what is the what is the purpose that I'm coming here for what how would my life change in any way if I did not show up here for an hour or two hours on a Sunday morning so what is the purpose now again a woman might think well I just feel great I feel good when I come I I leave feeling happy because I you know, got to sing these songs, whatever. I don't, you know, I'm not sure what motivates women. But for men, men might be thinking, oh, I don't care about just going to feel good. I could sleep in and then watch a football game on Sunday afternoon and feel just as happy and fulfilled. But if the church is a, a gym or a training ground to train men to, to be on mission, then it becomes essential that they're a part of it. But when men are like, they may not be able to articulate why they don't 
want to go to church, but then they're just told, well, if you're a really good Christian, just put up with it and, you know, what I don't know, stop being a toxic man. I'm not sure what men are told, uh, but they're definitely told to put up with it, that their Christianity is toxic and that they need to get more in touch with their feelings. <clears throat> so continuing on, it says, this isn't the correct response because these problems are rooted much deeper than simply the attendance of men in church. To have the desire to get men back to church, it's important to understand why it's imp important to me have men in church. When women convert, there's a 17% chance that the whole home follows with men. Follows. With men, it's 93%. So if the father comes to faith in Christ, 93% chance that the wife and kids do. 17% chance if just the, the mom does. While we are thankful for godly mothers, it's pivotal to understand the importance of godly fathers in the home and in the church. So I think if I was to speculate on what what this means, at least in part, men coming to faith in Christ are then going to lead their family over the horizon into this new venture, into this relationship with Christ. Women, what, like what, what we see with Timothy, his grandmother and his mother in the home taught him the scriptures. But it's the father who's, who's kind of breaking that new ground and leading and saying, here's what we're going to go. Here's the path we're going to go. We're going to go to church. We're going to be involved in here. We're going to be involved in this aspect of the church. We are going to go to this Bible study on such and such a day. Here's the direction we are going as a family while the mother is caring for the children and her and her husband are, are moving ahead in their walk with the Lord and she's in the home caring for the children in the home. But if it's the woman trying to break those grounds and break forward and, and, and drag the family in a direction, it's just it's just not gonna not gonna work out. Or seventeen percent of the time it works out. The solution to most of these problems is as simple as having an orthodox understanding of the issues, starting with the view of our relationship to God. As stated before, our relationship isn't boyfriend girlfriend, but father child. Further, the relationship we have with God is covenantal, not that of a 21st century dating couple. The best representation of how this of this is how Abraham slept as God enacted the covenant, signifying it's 100% on him. As if even a portion of the covenant relied on Abraham, it would be broken as Abraham was sinful. Many have further conflated the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church, as between Christ and the members of the body by saying, we're dating Jesus. This commits the fallacy of division by attributing the quality of the body to the individual. So that's what I kind of mentioned earlier. The church is said to be the bride of Christ. You are not the bride of Christ as the individual. The church is the bride of Christ. So that relationship is supposed to be a picture of how Christ is leading the church and how Christ is leading the body of Christ there might be aspects of that that can be pushed to the individual, but that's not what the point of what Paul is trying to say. So it's a picture of Christ and the church, not Christ and the individual. So when you say, well, no, Jesus just loves his bride and you're his bride, so Jesus just loves you like a bride, uh, that's, not, that's not really what that passage is saying. So instead, Christ gave us marriage as an image to understand the relationship between Christ and his bride. The husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything to their husbands. So that's really the parallel. It's not you as a church parishioner and Christ as the bride in Christ, it's the husband and wife. Marriage in the family structure is to teach us about Christ. However, real authority requires ability to exercise authority. Men must be taught how to love their wives, not by becoming their errand boy, but by being their prophet, priest, and king as Christ is to the church. As the purpose of worship is to glorify God and edify the saints, as we worship God in spirit and truth, we need rich and true songs that reflect such truths. Why sing, heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of my chest, when you could sing, Christ shall have dominion over land and sea. Earth's remotest region shall his empire be. I mean, again, that is not, that's just a picture of that, that lyric. is just like, 
from, you know, how he loves us. It's like, okay, God does love us. And what we, what that song is implying is he loves us like a boyfriend and girlfriend, just the sloppy kiss and your heart. Ooh, it's fluttering in my chest. And Ooh, just like when you first meet that, that beautiful young girl and you're just, Ooh, oh, is, I love her so much. And she's makes me feel so good. And that's what it's like with Jesus. And it's like, man, that's, that's very superficial. <laughs> you know, that kind of Eros love, it's just based on how I feel and it's just this attraction. And st- you know, that's why I think a lot of people, they come to Christ and that's, you know, they, they might have an emotional reaction and they think that's going to sustain them. And it's just like, man, if you think that that honeymoon phase is going to last through a marriage and last through relationships, that person's going to start getting on your nerves that person's going to start asking things of you that are challenging, and they should anyways, that are challenging and difficult and tough because it's what's good for you and good for the family and good for your relationship and a marriage. It's not always going to be. That's why I was telling somebody the other day, I said, you know what? Like, I don't know that I like dating where you are putting on airs, where it's like, we're going to go to a nice fancy restaurant and, you know, we're going to. We're, we're going to, you know, spend a hundred, hundred fifty dollars on this nice restaurant and we're going to have this great elaborate date or whatever. I mean, those things are nice, but that's not what life is going to be like. If we're starting our relationship by saying, oh, you know, let's, let's have this best, best, go to the best restaurant. We're going to dress up and everything's going to be perfect. It's like, that's not life. I would much rather say, Hey, we're just going to go out to this bar we're going to have some burgers and fries or we're going to go just sit down and have coffee and talk. That to me is a better representation of what a relationship is going to be like because that's the things you're going to be doing day in and day out, right? Just eating normal food and talking over a cup of coffee. It's not going to be fancy restaurants that make you feel good and getting wined and dined and stuff. That that's a that's a mirage. So you might be able to say, oh, I love this person so much. They just make me feel so good. Well, of course, you're being wined and dined on a a night on the town. That's not life. So when people have that expectation that, oh, when I come to Jesus, it's just going to be all this lovey-dovey, feel-good stuff. It's like, not if we're on mission, not if we're uh, fighting this fight and training like soldiers. Paul says a soldier does not get entangled in civilian affairs. He only does what is pleasing to his commanding officer. So this is not just, you know, flowers and roses and uh, happy, slappy Christian living. It's not just the sloppy, wet kiss nonsense. It is a battle. And men, I think, men can handle that. Men want that. They want to know why am I doing what I'm doing. And um, I think, so I think we need to get back to that kind of stuff. So continues on nearing the end says, Picking songs that can be sung by a congregation is also important as many contemporary worship songs are simply out of the range of most men. They're sung by a bunch of women. Discipleship for men must look different than women sitting around sipping coffee. Once I was in a men's study and a guy was going through hard times and the leader kept asking him questions like a therapist about how it made him feel. The guy responded by saying, I don't want to talk about my feelings. I want to shove them down deep and sit in a deer stand. Sometimes that's what men need. Treating every problem in life like it requires a therapy session is going to drive men away. I think this is very true. There are times when I think men need to process what's going on. Doing it probably in a group in front of a bunch of other men is probably not a very good, is probably not very likely to happen. Unless what your goal is to try to say, we need to make all men emasculated and normalize this crying and weeping in front of other men. When in reality, maybe what should be taught is strength, responsibility, um, purpose, honor, being on mission. Like, again, keep going back to this military language, but it's so prominent in the New Testament. It would not do anyone good. In, in the heat of battle, to sit around having a struggle session, crying about how tough the battle is and how tough the war is. There might be a time for that. There might be a time when a soldier comes back and he says, I need to talk to somebody about and process what's going on. But to sit around in, in the barracks and are in the bunker with a bunch of other soldiers crying about how scared you are, not very productive to fighting the good fight. 
And so to, to normalize that within Christianity is going to weaken men. They're not going to be effective in spiritual battle. And then they're going to ask the question, why in the world do I fight the good fight in the world at work? I'm fighting for promotion. I'm fighting for a, a, a bigger paycheck to bring home to my family. I'm fighting the competition in the marketplace. But then in church, I'm being told, sit around and cry about your feelings with a bunch of other men. That doesn't seem appealing to me. Whereas if we can say, no, there's a there's a war to be fought in the church too, and you're a vital part of that, it normalizes duty and responsibility rather than weeping struggle sessions. So it ends by saying, instead, sometimes men need other Christian men to just be there and sit quietly in that deer stand with them. These trips provide great opportunities to talk about God's word. Some of the best conversations I've had about God's word have come on the boat waiting for a bite. So, I mean, there's a couple more uh, points where they link to, and I'll link to this whole Twitter thread uh, by Smash Bales, but that is discipleship. Discipleship, I think, happens when guys can just get together and live life, and that often entails, yes, if you're a hunter, sitting in the deer blinds together, fishing, fishing together. Sometimes it's, you know, going out grabbing a, a, a beer or sit, hanging out at the bar. It's, it's, it's not sitting around crying and, and trying to get in touch with your emotions. Not that there's anything wrong with that. In a proper context, typically that is not with other dudes. There's a reason why young boys pick on each other if they start crying or showing their emotions because that's just the way guys are. And to just tell them, well, that means you're a bad Christian if you do that is not helpful. We need men to understand that it's okay to be strong and it's necessary to be strong to bear their responsibilities, to, to, to live into this battle that we're being called for. Because <clears throat> just the way humans are made, if we tell men, just sit in the bunker and cry, the Great Commission is not going to get done. We, we need women to be fighting in the Great Commission. But the way people are wired is men are going to have to be leading that fight and dragging their women in to the battle too. Just like you might have women medics caring for the men and healing the brokenhearted and healing the hurt on a battlefield. But if men aren't fighting in the war, there's no women out there fighting it. There's, these women aren't going to be out there on their front battle. So then the Great Commission doesn't get done. And again, probably not super uh, politically correct to talk about men and women this way, but it is what it is, and I do think that that's why uh, men aren't interested in the church, because there's no point to it. There's no point to church if there's no emphasis on the Great Commission. There's no discipleship if there's no reason to be discipled. Why would I get discipled? Discipleship is just like training. Why train if there's no battle? And if there's no battle, why even get involved in any of this enterprise at all? I'm not interested in just sitting around talking about my feelings and being told to, to feel better and to have uh, a smile on my face all the time. So emphasize mission, emphasize the Great Commission, emphasize the need for discipleship and serious discipleship and serious training. I think men will come back to church if they see that there's a purpose for it. So that's this episode. Uh, in the next one, we'll get back into the book of James, but I felt like that was a good topic to divert from and spend a little bit of time talking about. So have a good one. While Faith and Focus is a ministry of and faith, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of in faith as a mission.